Welcome Classic Rock fans to one of my worst to best videos and today we're looking at the albums of ACDC. We're going to look at the studio albums and studio albums only, the international versions of that so there's no compilation albums uh, and no live albums. I would like to point out of course that these are my own personal preferences regarding these albums. Yours may well differ from mine which is absolutely fine. Uh, by all means go to the comments below and let me know how you, you would rank these albums in ascending or descending order, it's entirely up to you. Whilst you're down there, it would really help me a lot if you look at some of the links for ways you can support me and my channel. I would really appreciate it. So with no further ado, let's see how these albums would rank within the ACDC discography. Or I could say ACDC canon if I was feeling particularly waggish. Number 15 is Blow Up Your Video from 1988. This is one of those albums that predictably usually languishes at the bottom of these kind of lists. Uh, that or Fly on the Wall, of course. All the ingredients are in place in terms of what we expect from this band, you know, the Angus's and Malcolm's crunching riffs and that familiar tubercular rasp from Brian Johnson. And I must admit I do rather like the militaristic and technological themes that are explored on this record in the in the title track and, and the songs like Heat Seeker, for example. Overall we get a fairly steady album and a fairly decent stab at songwriting within the paradigms that is ACDC. You know, there's some great hooks and great rhythms on this record. But it has to be said there's quite a lot of filler as well. In fact, Greg Prato of All Music said, This album is unfocused and glutted with throwaways. It's worth pointing out, of course, that Malcolm Young was uh, in the throes of alcohol addiction, alcoholism at the time of making this album, and that might in some way lean towards explaining some of the inconsistencies with this record. Number 14 is Stiff Up a Lip from 2000. Yeah, there was, there was five years between the Ball Breaker album and this one. And this album has a, a, a bluesier feel, which I, which I quite like. It's not forced or contrived in any way. I especially like on this album that wonderful guitar interplay between Angus and Malcolm Young. Has to be said, I consider Malcolm Young to be very much the engine of this band. Has to be said that ACDC is great at what they do. It's, uh, it, they're a band that stake their reputation on power, volume and attitude. So often when we assess these albums, we have to look at things like production values and, uh, and songwriting, of course. And in those respects, uh, this album does not stick its head above the parapet. I think Meltdown is a, is a great number, but the rest of the album just feels like ACDC by numbers. No shoot to thrill here. Number 13 is Rock or Bust from 2014. I so wanted to like this album. It's, uh, it's one that's haunted by Malcolm Young, of course, who rattles his chains from the margins of this one, especially as the band used a lot of the riffs that he and Malcolm had demoed uh, prior to recording this album. So for me, this album does have a slightly reverential feel, uh, markedly so, and quite rightly so as well. Uh, it, it, it has that in common with uh, Back in Black, of course. But it has to be said that the quality of songs are just not there for this one. I mean, the track like Dogs of War just drags on. It's a bit of a dirge, really. There are, I mean, the ones that I really do like on this album, I love the swagger of Sweet Candy. I uh, got some rock and roll as, uh, got some rock and roll thunder is a great one. It's worth pointing out the band had to weather quite a few storms, you know, emotionally, creatively while making this album, which does affect the overall vibe and quality of it. Number 12 is Black Eyes from 2008. There was a lot of hype and anticipation for this record, and ACDC had secured a renewed cultural contemporary relevance, if you like, by having a lot of their songs featured in Hollywood movies. And I must admit, this album contains one of the best ACDC tracks ever in the guise of Rock and Roll Train. It's the very embodiment of everything this band personifies. And other songs on here that are worth noting, we get the explosive, brutal, primitive, and loads of other adjectives you can throw at it. Songs like uh, Skies on Fire, Big Jack, Anything Goes on War Machine. Unfortunately, though, this album tends to falter in terms of its quality, and it goes on way too long, which kind of dilutes the brilliance of the tracks I've just mentioned. It makes the album feel like a bit of a laborious uh, uh, affair, to be honest with you. In fact, uh, Austin Powell said that the album, despite a few cheap thrills, it lacks the urgent indecency of a real ACDC album. Number 11 is Fly on the Wall from 1985. This is the ACDC album, of course, that everybody likes to crap on. Uh, but I quite like it, to be honest with you. I don't know if that's just nostalgia or whether it has um, uh, some sentimental value for me. That's quite, all these things are quite possible. But I, I love the album, I love the artwork. Uh, I love that little EP that you got with that VHS EP. I thought that was great. It often gets criticized for having a rather stripped down approach, very much like its predecessor, but I think that's one of the album's strengths, to be honest with you. I love the opening riff of the title track. Uh, I love the tracks uh, Sink the Pink. Of course, ACDC are not really known for their subtlety. Their, their albums tend to have more double entendres than an episode of Up Pompeii. 
Shake Your Foundations, Danger uh, is another one. I like all these with hella high water. If I had to make one criticism of this record is that, is that Johnson's vocals are quite low in the mix. Now, this can be a kind of a production trope that works very well. It works devastatingly well on the Stones Exile on Main Street album where Jagger's voice is very murky and uh, almost subterranean. It adds to that sense of menace. But with here, I just think it's bad mixing. I must admit, I'd love to hear a remix of this album. Uh, interesting aside, of course, singer-songwriter Ryan Adams uh, is a big fan of this record. Number 10 is Ball Breaker from 1995. For me, this album has a renewed energy and vigor to it. Many critics, of course, feel that the, a lot of the later ACDC albums were, were becoming too generic. It's interesting, because course, that Phil Rudd actually returns for this album. I think he's, he took a, like, a 12-year hiatus. And, of course, Rick Rubin produces this album. A lot of people do not get on with his production style. I personally find it very hit and miss. Uh, I don't like the sound of some of those uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers albums but I do love the sound that he's achieved on that uh, wonderful ZZ Top album, La Futura. In terms of the sound of this album, uh, some critics feel that it lacks crunch, it lacks testosterone. Now, interesting, the band sifted through hours and hours of material. They redid the songs over and over again to try and get the sound right. But I don't agree with the critics uh, of this album. I think it has got a warm, inviting sound, as uh, Classic Rock described it. The album has a creative force and focus, but I think it simply lacks the quality of tunage that I would expect from a top shelf ACDC album. I enjoy the opener, Hard as Rock. Burning Alive is an interesting one, of course. It, it deals with the dangers of religious zealots or that kind of fanaticism. I think this album devalues itself in, in some respects as it, there's, there's too many tired, shagging references on it. It comes across as one big priapic yop. We live in a different world now, of course, even so for 1995, where lyrics such as her hot potatoes were elevate, yeah, sheer poetry, eh? Uh, just wouldn't cut the mustard, and that's not a euphemism in any way. There were some great riffs on this album, befitting of any uh, ACDC album, of course, but uh, all that cockwaggling stuff had had its day, as far as I'm concerned. Number nine is Razor's Edge from 1990s. The, uh, it's, it's like a quintessential ACDC album. It's pretty damn good. You know, you can throw adjectives like muscular, rowdy, abrasive. They all seem to stick when we think of this album. It's full of blistering power chords and hooks and all those usual ACDC archetypes are very much apparent within the unabashed, unrestrained lyrics. Brian Johnson sounds reinvigorated for this album. Angus Young is on fire, especially on songs like uh, Shot of Love, Razor's Edge and Got You By The Balls. And producer Bruce Fairburn, who produced Aerosmith's Permanent Vacation, does an excellent job. On this album, he captures the hunger and drive of a much younger band. You get tracks like Thunderstruck with that wonderful Angus riff and those terrace chants. Other songs like uh, Fire Your Guns and Money Talks, which is, is interesting as well. You get Brian Johnson assuming the swagger of some Wall Street Lothario with lyrics like, Hey little girl, you wanted all furs, the diamonds, the painting on the wall. Mistress for Christmas is one inspired by Donald Trump. So it's quite prophetic in some respects, but nevertheless, it's a pretty awful number. This album, of course, kicks off uh, a decade where words like new metal and grunge were very much part of the popular lexicon. This is very much the sound of a band trying to reclaim its territory in many respects, uh, and it does sound a little bit anachronistic, especially when we think of the topography of the rock landscape was one that was marred by the nihilism of teen spirit. Now, my to flick the switch from 1983. This album takes a lot of flack uh, simply by being compared with the albums that precedes it. Uh, but I like I, th I like this album. I think it's got a lot of standout tracks on it. And I, th I really uh, respect the fact that the band wanted to strip back all those production affectations associated with Mutt Lang and his style to a rawer, harder ACDC sound. And that stripped back minimalistic approach is reflected in the wonderful artwork as well. You get songs like Guns For Hire, which is a, a wonderful ACDC number, perhaps one of my top 10. Uh, Nervous Shakedown as well, which is a great one. But there were certainly some subpar numbers on this one. For example, Bedlam in Belgium and Down in the Hole, they, they have the feel of, of something that's just been reheated and, and chucked on there for good measure. In fact, Classic Rock has said of this album, lyrically, the light motif has shifted from impish to oafish. But overall, I think this album is, is pretty damn good. It's also the last album to feature Phil Rudd, who would depart after this one. Number seven is Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap from 1976. Now this album in the USA was released uh, after the success of Back in Black. It was kind of rode that album's coattail, so to speak. And I think American audience was rather, rather um, surprised to hear Bon Scott's filthy drawl in comparison to uh, Brian Johnson's familiar tubercular wail. And there's some great tracks on this album from that uh, frenetic boogie of Problem Child to the 
uh, Carry On Bon, that is Big Balls. And that menacing title track, actually inspired by a cartoon that Angus and Malcolm enjoyed as children, uh, is still a live favourite today. It still forms part of the ACDC set. We also get tracks like uh, uh, The Rocker, which is, is we've got Bon in full self mythologising mode. And of course, we get Ride On, which is uh, hailed as a real triumph in terms of uh, songwriting for ACDC. It's, it's quite an introspective, searching, bluesy ballad where uh, Bon sort of goes beyond all the chest thumping to uh, present us with quite a, an interesting perspective. And the song, of course, that gains extra poignancy after Bond's early demise. Of this album, of course, All Music said uh, it captured the seething malevolence of Bond Scott, encouraged by the maniacal riffs of Angus and Malcolm Young. There was a real sense of danger to this record. Number six is For Those About to Rock from 1981. This album, of course, arrives in a thundering volley, a thundering volley which closes every ACDC show since this album, I believe. It's, um, you know, some great tracks on here, Spellbound, COD, uh, and Let's Get It Up, of course. It's quite a period of transition for this uh, band at this juncture. They sacked their manager, and I think they were getting very bored with uh, Mutt Lang's uh, driven perfection in terms of production values and sound. It has to be said that this album lacks that uh, igniting spark that was very much apparent on Back in Black. It lacks the wit and humour, I, I think, that sort of mischievous sneer that uh, uh, Bond brought to the proceedings. There's no doubt that Back in Black was infused with that energy and spirit of paying tribute to Bond Scott, but I think by the time we get, by the time we get to this record, it's, it's evident that the band miss him. The songs seem uh, at times a tad forced, and they certainly lack that uh, mischievous wit that we associate with Bond Scott. The only track on this record that reaches the giddy heights of Back in Black is that uh, cinematic title track with its gargantuan riff and uh, volley at the end, of course. The sound was certainly very polished on this record. I think it was Mutt Lang's last album with them. I could be wrong on that, though. In fact, I think one critic um, described ACDC at this juncture as power pop. This, of course, caused the Young Brothers to recoil in absolute horror and obviously resulted in the next album being a stripped down, roar affair, getting back to that uh, purer ACDC sound. Number five is High Voltage from 1976, well, the international version. And this album is essentially a compilation album, really, comprising of tracks from their first two Australian releases. Uh, I love this album. I, I really feel it's, uh, it's kind of like a manifesto for the band, a mission statement, where they, it perfectly encapsulates everything this band really would really epitomise. Even the title track intrinsically speaks the band's name, structured around the chords ACDC. Although it has to be said, not everybody was a fan of this album. In fact, Rolling Stone described it as an all-time low for rock music. I love TNT. It has a, a Neanderthal, yobbish sensibility to it. Uh, we got the, the dirty blues with the Jack, of course, which has seen Angus dropping his kecks live for a, a number of years now. And, of course, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. What a wonderful song. in it. Bon in full self-mythologising mode. He talks about the travails and uh, issue problems of... Uh, uh, making it so to speak and whoever thought of uh, putting bagpipes on a, on a rock song like this at this juncture was a sheer genius and the way he sings this song is absolutely wonderful he perfectly communicates the hunger and ambition of a young band and before his power age from 1978 now this one could be the top of anyone's list it's a it's a feral slab of rock and roll it's absolutely wonderful uh, mooted by Keith Richards of course as being the best of ACDC albums it's raucous, it's powerful, it's primal. You get wonderful tracks like Riff Raff, of course, that is, uh, and Rock and Roll Damnation, of course, very much provides the tone for this album. Interesting, it was also the first album to feature Cliff Williams. Of this album, one critic has written, uh, Power Age was the last time they were raw and underproduced and in their element, it's gritty and real. I love the maturing in songwriting, which is apparent on this record, especially in songs like Down Payment Blues. There's a wonderful line in that song, feeling like a paper cup floating down a storm drain, focusing instead of, instead of tub thumping about the, the glories of fame and being life in a rock and roll band, he starts to sing about th something that is just beyond his reach. He's like Tantalus in many respects. And also I love the song Next to the Moon with a lovely jangly riff, which I think the band have been pulling out live recently. What's interesting, of course, about that song as well, we see the band moving away from those block power chords that we got on the earlier records. It's, uh, it shows a band moving beyond its own archetypes of sound and presentation. Other interesting songs on here, Gone Shooting, of course, is a, a song that's apparently inspired by Bon Scott's then-girlfriend. And uh, Sin City, of course, which is a, an absolute classic, 
a thinly veiled metaphor for the band's tour of America, I believe, uh, slightly hidden behind the motif of a gambler in Las Vegas. Number three is Highway to Hell from 1979. Mutt Lang uh, finessed and fine-tuned that ACDC sound for this record. It's rugged and ragged, it's still very much apparent, the riffs and the rhythms and Bon Scott's uh, filthy drawl, of course. And the record is, is packed with classic ACDC fare, of course. You get the very self-effacing shot down in flames, one of my favourites of this record. The very FM radio friendly touch too much, and of course the anthemic title track. The band have been placed under a considerable amount of pressure from the record company to try and polish their sound and come up with a more commercial edge, shall we say. Several cover versions were suggested that the band should cover. One of them, of course, was uh, Give Me Some Loving by the Spencer Davis group. A call out has to go to, to Mutt Lang, the producer on this. I mean, his genius is apparent, is written all over this record from, you know, um, taking that energy and power of ACDC and trying to craft it in something that FM radio could get into bed with. In fact, he'd just come from uh, producing the Boomtown Rats to fill the producer's chair for this record. And the whole thing sounds effortless and spontaneous. He, does, he performs a wonderful conjuring trip where he takes that ACDC energy and power and add some discipline and precision. Everything is exact. Um, in fact, Classic Rock says, if I may quote, Lang had much of a hand in the sound and exactness of this album. The Larry Gang vocals on the chorus of Walk All Over You, those economical, brutal, effective guitar stabs on the verses of Touch Too Much. The breath robbing full tilt climax of If You Want Blood. The unstoppable rolling momentum of Girls Got Rhythm. Classic Rock says a lot of that is down to Mutt Lang's perfectionism. There were no missed beats or out of tune guitars on this one. And Bon Scott really steals a show on this one. He says that still has that rough and tumble barroom brawl uh, aesthetic to him. And never more so, of course, in that defiant title track, uh, in the face of the great unknown or that undiscovered country. He just greets it with that familiar gap-toothed Lothario grin of his. There's no doubt that this album is just a sheer joy to listen to. And number two is Back in Black from 1980. Many would argue that this is one of the greatest hard rock albums of all time. Of course, it came straight after the uh, sad demise of Bon Scott. And it's a tribute to their fallen singer, apparent, of course, with its all-black sleeve and that tolling bell that opens the album. It has to be said, of course, Brian Johnson sounds absolutely incredible on this, uh, this album, and their producer, Mutt Lang, does a wonderful job in crafting that ACDC sound. It's the complete package. Wonderful tracks like Shoot the Thrill and Rock and Roll Like Noise Pollution. And of course the, the wonderful, wonderful title track. And of course, uh, Brian Johnson wanted to show that he could match Bon in terms of the spicy lyric wordplay in uh, You Shook Me All Night Long. Uh, she told me to come, but I was already there. This song is a perfect example of Lang's ability to bring a polished pop sensibility to a hard rock sound. Angus Young, of course, describes this album as our tribute to Bon, which of course it is. It's uh, a wonderful, uh, incredibly successful record born out of adversity. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, so to speak. In terms of the ACDC sound, I tend to miss that intoxicated swagger we get with Bon. With this album, there was a fundamental shift to a more stadium rock sensibility with these uh, huge anthemic numbers we get on this record. There's no doubt this record is outstanding, but then of course it had to be. If it was anything less, it could have well struck the death knell for this band. My favourite track on this album is the title track. It's a track that's been described by classic rock as, a, uh, as like the blues, as if it was deconstructed by Satan and then rebuilt by Tony Stark. There is no doubt that out of the ashes rose this band's greatest triumph. And number one, my go-to ACDC album is Let There Be Rock from 1977. It's like some Old Testament proclamation. This album is certainly biblical in its proportions as a, a wild, feral, and uh, it's probably the heaviest record they've ever done. In fact, the sessions were so loud, there's a bit of classic rock apocrypha that says that Angus's amp actually caught fire while they were recording it. I don't know if that's true or not. But one thing for sure, this is certainly an incendiary album. There's no ACDC album that better captures the spirit of this band. You know, it was released in 1977. You've got to remember in 77, you had a landscape that was very much marred by the spit and nihilism of punk. And this album feels like the perfect repost to those safety-pinned, phlegmy upstarts. It has a raw edge, a frenzied intensity, and a streetwise strut that uh, I think crossed the, the divide, the generic divide appealing to punks and rockers alike. In fact, Q Magazine named Let There Be Rock as one of the 50th, heaviest albums of all time. Of course, it's an album that features ACDC's most feral and memorable riff, of course, their pay into a 19 stone groupie. Of course, we get some great tracks on this album, uh, for example, Bad Boy Boogie, Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be. 
it's an album stripped of all those, uh, it's an album that predates all those polished production affectations of Mutt Lang, of course. It was also the first ACT album to be released with that, that famous logo, and it was also the last album to feature bassist uh, Mark Evans. This is the album where the band forged their manifesto in blood, sweat and intensity. It also features a wonderful title track, uh, inspired by Genesis, of course. That's the Old Testament book, not the band. And of course, it's this album where the band proclaimed from the pulpit, of course, that this band shall epitomise high octane, no shit rock and roll. And that's what I love about it. It has a real nasty feel to it. It almost feels as if two sides of vinyl is just not enough to contain all the energy and power of this record that threatens to descend into some sort of feedback frenzy at any moment. It was an album that was recorded live in the studio and its rawness is apparent and also part of its charm. On this record, mistakes were positively embraced, it seems. There's an energy and power that positively crackles and throbs from the amplifiers. I mean, never mind the bollocks, this album is the real deal. And what I like about this record is they perfectly capture the sound of a sound being effectively deconstructed and intensified. Anyway, that's my ranking of the ACDC albums. If you enjoy my musings on music, do check out some of the links below for ways you can support me and my channel. Do check out the Facebook page, of course, I do post on there on a, a daily basis. Also, be sure to click like, subscribe, and check that bell so you get notified of any future uploads. A shout out has to go to Ed Phil, who is responsible for the wonderful Angus caricature in the thumbnail that I've used. I will put a link to his YouTube channel up here so you can just check that out and see what other work he does. So it just leaves me to say thank you for watching. Do stay safe, but more importantly, please do keep listening.